right, welcome everyone. Welcome aboard. Um, back to Scope. Uh, Scope is a series of conversations related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and is brought to you by the APA's Diversity Committee. That committee is charged with clearing a path to success for its members who are traditionally underrepresented or marginalized. BIPOC, Black Indigenous, people of color, women, Asian American and Pacific Islanders, LGBTQIA+, and those with physical challenges. We're so happy to welcome a very special guest today, but before we do that, let's introduce our hosts. Gonzalo. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Gonzalo Guzman. Um, I'm a photographer and writer based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I'm on the National Diversity Committee and also on the Chicago APA board. Hi everyone, my name is Edwin Vargas. I am a um, photographer and filmmaker um, based in San Francisco, California, and I am a proud member of the diversity and founder of the diversity committee member, and I'm also a board member of the San Francisco APA chapter. And so happy to be here with all of you. And I'm Liam Clickinger. I use he, him pronouns. I'm co-owner of Capital Art Studios in San Francisco, director of APA San Francisco, and a founding member of the APA Diversity Committee as well. Super happy to be here. Before we get rolling, just a couple of little housekeeping things. One is um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, it will be added to our YouTube channel and will be a podcast eventually. Um, we will link to our guest website and socials and that stuff in the descriptions on YouTube and the podcast. So keep an eye out there. Um, and time permitting, we may or may not do a little Q&A at the end of this. Um, so stay tuned for that as well. I'd also just a real quick little um, second to let you all know about a really wonderful program um, from APA Los Angeles called the Bridge Program. Um, they're offering three free portfolio reviews at their upcoming event, October 8th, uh, to photographers from underrepresented and traditionally marginalized communities. Uh, the deadline for that is September 23rd, so uh, right around the corner. You can find more information at la.apanational.org. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gonzalo and Edwin. Awesome. Well, we are so excited to introduce you to our guest here, Daniel Aras Aguilar. Um, Daniel Aras won the grant that APA DC uh, put together, and we are so excited to have Daniel with us. In this interview, we're going to learn a little bit about their work. So let me read their bio. Daniel Aras Aguilar, he, she, then, is a gender non-conforming artist born in Colombia and now based in Harlem. Daniel grew up in Florida where their family immigrated seeking refugee. Following their graduation from high school, Daniel transferred to BMCC in Manhattan after leaving college without a degree. They became assistant to photographer Mike Reese and later began Production, producing commercial and editorial work for established fashion photographers. Daniel currently holds a residency at the Bronze Axe Arts Factory and is recipient of the Enfoco Photography Fellowship 2022. So we're so happy and excited to have you here, Daniel. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Um, we're gonna have um, a few questions that we wanna know specific about your background in photography. And um, one of the qu first questions that we have um, reading here for you, it's um, what is your background with photography? Yeah, um, let me start off by just giving my thanks to everybody at the APA and um, knowing, telling you how much this actually means to me. Um, my background started off as um, I think most people would say that they started photographing since they were children. Um, I did. I grew up in a family in a house with a lot of cameras around. Um, but after 
moving to New York City, I um, I fell out of love with my first passion, which was music, and I began doing visual art instead. Um, so I began assisting uh, photographer Mike Ruiz, um, and that's where I learned in studio lighting, and I learned how to um, develop concepts and approach um, people uh, to create a, a series of of work. Um, I think that was the first time that I set foot in a photo studio, in a professional photo studio. Um, after that, I decided that um, I wanted to get a little bit more of an inside of the business. So I began working for Rachel Elliston Photographers here in New York. And with them, I began doing production for commercial edits for your work in, um, for brands, um, for European brands and, and some American brands here. Um, so I got to work firsthand with some great, amazing artists. Um, and as of 2016, I decided to um, begin pursuing my own career and picking up where I had left off when I was working with Mike. And instead of doing production, I felt that I um, was much happier um, pursuing work as, as, a, as a lens-based artist. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing all that. Um, where do you find your inspiration? Um, um, it's hard to say. I, I think for the most part, is it works the other way. The, the, the waves flow the other way around. It's more like inspiration finds me. Um, that's the way that I like to think about it because um, it comes when I'm not waiting, where I'm not looking for it. Um, I think it's... Uh, culture um it's a huge one um i i always say that i'm very biased towards the people that i can resonate with um so definitely queer individuals um people of color and um just authenticity i think it's probably one of the things that drives me to actually be inspired the most is um seeing something that is being its most authentic self or it's living its best life or or just thriving i think i think that's what inspires me that's great it's very inspiring to hear these words um how has your experience impacted your approach to photography um um Sorry, could you repeat it one more time? Yeah. How <laughs> has your experience impacted your approach to photography? Um, I think being an immigrant and a person of color has um, definitely impacted the way that I approach um, the lens. Um, that was one of the main reasons why I decided to step away from fashion at that point was the fact that I was a bit, um, how do you say that, not frustrated, but um, I wasn't happy with the fact that I was seeing so much whitewashing happening in the zeitgeist of the industry, or into the industry itself, and that in itself would reflect in the zeitgeist of the country. Um, I always say that racism and um, racism and um, sorry and um, Immigration are two things that play a huge part in most of my work and if anything in all of my work, because those are two things that I have to deal with since um, since coming to America and since, um, since throughout my entire life. Um, so definitely, I think those two things, racism and immigration are, are, are things that very much impact my work, um, as well as, as queer studies and um and yeah i would say those three things mostly impact most of the stuff that i do great well thank you for answering my questions i gotta pass it on to gonzalo that has a couple mm -hmm. of others that wants to know. um yeah i think that that's a really good transition for us to move into talking about the specific project that you submitted for this grant um we're actually going to have juliet uh bring some of the images that you did um, for the specific project uh, so that everybody can see. But if you want to just give us a little bit of an, an introductory like kind of background to like 
what this project is about and the specific group of people that you're working with. Of course. So um, Sandunga Nukamwere is the name of the project. Um, it roughly translates to um, Her Beauty Never Dies. Um, it is a project that I began um, ends of 2020, beginning of 2021. And um, in essence, is it's something that's a series that's continuing to grow just parallel to, to myself as well. Um, I um, came across Shaneti, who is an advocate. She is a mushe. Um, and getting to know Shaneti through social media sort of inspired, like I said before, uh, people's authenticity really inspires me in seeing Shaneti. Um, and her work as an advocate and to bring awareness to, to Mushes and, um, and the discrimination and uh, also the, the, just to bring awareness to the culture and also to, to, to advocate for the culture. That's what inspired me. Um, and so later on in 2021, just um, out of coincidence, I was able to go to Oaxaca I was doing a project with another friend, but it had nothing to do with any of this. And, and I told myself, I was like, well, if I'm going to be geographically in the location, I should probably reach out and get to know um, other people, other folk. Um, so I, I essentially linked up and we started creating this dialogue between us about, you know, um, her experiences and um and that's kind of how we began um just throwing around ideas about this project um i knew that from the beginning i did not want to approach something um in a in a reportage or documentative kind of way i i wanted to do things that were not necessarily what you would find in like a National Geographic or some sort of cultural profile. I think what I wanted to do mostly was, since my background is fashion, I wanted to um, create some sort of premeditated and elevated portraits that would be descriptive and then somehow encapsulate some a little bit of the experience that um this woman and this gender not conforming folk are are living through and experiencing um and can you like elaborate a little bit more on like like what are the like uh the things that kind of define like the specific community that you're working with of course i think one thing that really triggered me from the beginning was the relationship that the Mushi community has with the Catholic Church, um, very much knowing that the Catholic Church in itself was um, was um, that guilty uh, was responsible for the Crusades, and even to this day, when you set foot in Oaxaca, there are so many uh, bastilles and cathedrals, and most of those religious centers were essentially built over. Um, holy land and and um, uh, for for um, Zapotec burial grounds, in other words. Um, and Zapotec is, is the indigenous community that's native to Juchitan and the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, which is that region of Mexico. Um, so I think that was one of the things. Also, it was, um, it was, the fact that a lot of Western media had essentially covered this region and this group of people as living in a paradise, sort of sort of thing, they would describe it as uh, as a region or a paradise for for transgender transgender community, um, which in itself is is erroneous because not all mushes are transgender. I think it's important to separate the idea of. Um, sexual orientation and gender identity. Those are two different concepts. And I, I also think that um, for me, um, sorry, lost my train of thought, but um, 
um, yeah, I, I, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> um, um, you were talking, oh, yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry, you can go. No, I was just saying, I was just gonna, I was just saying you were just talking about like, uh, how not everybody in the community like would identify as transgender, but that's how it's been right. covered. Yes, that was another thing. So like seeing all this Western media coming and covering and seeing that um, not everybody's transgender, also that um, they made it seem like the community was all okay with it and thumbs up and everything was like dandy in this part of the, uh, the world, but which is not because at the end of the day, femicide has um, has been affecting so much of Mesoamerica, especially and Latin America and Brazil, um, that those numbers and those rates continue to go up and transgender folk anywhere in the world are, are continue to be murdered. And, and, and half of those times, those murders, most of the time, not, if not all of those times, those murders are not being brought to justice. Um, so I think it was, um, it was also that, that wrong media, Western media input and coverage that also propel me to saying, hey, you know, um, this is really how things are. And, and it is, it's, good, it's good to realize the fact that there are very common, um, there are very common variables in, I wanna say the queer experience and the LGBTQIA experience in general for a lot of people. Um, but at the end of the day, we can't put ourselves in the same we're not being marginalized in the same way, in the same manner. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be curious to know a little bit more about like how the project uh, developed. So when you first kind of uh, got your contact with them, did you know a lot about the community? Um, I began talking to Shanetti via Instagram back in early 2020. Um, sorry, in late 2020, and then in beginning of 2021, um, I began doing research. So prior to, to like, I had known about Mushas, but I had never, like, actually divulged into it and, like, and, and put my time into it. Um, I, it was at that point that I, I, decided to um, look into this as, as something that maybe perhaps I could do attribute some good to and, and, and bring out to light and, and collaborate with. Um, but it, through Shinetti, I ended up meeting Amitai and I met Mario. Um, and we, the three of us started having these conversations about what it was like to like not only be gay, but also what it's actually like to live in, in Huchitan and what the social cycles not only demand for you, demand from you, but also um, what different levels of marginalization happen within the community and in a more, um, social way like not just in the nucleus of mushas but also like in general um in mexico um how has this uh project like developed from kind of like when you like had this like initial like research and like history to like when you finally like met people and started talking to them you know how, I guess, like, how, how is what you thought the project was going to be? Has it changed at all? Yeah, no, definitely. It continues to grow. Um, like I said, when I first began, it's, it's interesting because when I first began with this project, it, it, I tried to do what I, you know, what I knew, I, what I knew how to do. So, like, I created a mood board. I thought about it the way that I wanted, uh, I anticipated this thing, so this images to look. Um, I think the only thing that has remained consistent is the fact that I photograph using uh, film, I photograph analog. But aside from that, um, with the help of the APA and the way that I'm approaching the project, the, the project now is definitely in a whole nother level. Um, 
I think in the beginning, I relied a lot on my eye for fashion photography, knowing willingly knowing that when I came, um, when I came to photograph, I was not going to photograph fashion photographs, but I knew that, um, but I knew that I kind of had the thought that that that's what I knew how to do and that's the best that I could give. Um, that being that it was a year ago now, it's it's more of um, it's more of I, I'm I'm really focusing more on the context than I am the image making. To be honest, um, it's still kind of like the same process in a sense. Like I would say, the bones of the project are still the same. It's kind of like everything else that I'm trimming down. Um, I continue to think about every single individual image based on the dialogue that I have with my friends. But, um, and that's how I create the image, but it's no longer about, um, I, I mean, I, I, I wanna say that there, there was a little bit, or that there was an instance in, 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 the, in this previous photographs where I felt like there was a lot of folklore. And that's something that I'm very much steering away from this time. I, I, I think with this, these images celebrate a lot of customs and traditions. And I think that's kind of what I don't want to move forward doing. I think what I want to move forward doing is, um, is emphasizing the individual in the photograph rather than the customs and traditions that are celebrated. Yeah, something that um, I like really appreciated in the the application that you submitted for your grant is you like very specifically like talk about that you didn't want it to feel like documentary or like reportage. And with that, you also have a very collaborative relationship with the people that you're photographing. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, some of the, some of the people that you work with in these images? Mm hmm. Um, in this particular image, um, the woman that is higher up in the in the clouds, um, their name is Shaneri. Um, They also go by Damian Gerardo. Um, they're an advocate. They were born in Juchitan, and then they moved to the coast, and then they ended up moving to Mexico City to pursue um, um, higher education at the University Autónoma de Ciudad de México. And then um, on the right is Amitai. And Amitai, when I went, was um, the reigning queen for the Autenticas um, Interpias Buscadoras de Peligro, which is a, um, a um, I guess, sorry, I'm just going back between Spanish and English in my head. <laughs> it's, a social, it's a social group um, entity that is made by Mushas for Mushas um to um bring together everyone in the community um and so every year they have a reigning queen and amita was a reigning queen that year um and then in another photograph um mario mario should be there rather mario ruben who is a, a renowned chef very well known and is right now one of the best people if you ever visit oaxaca you have to go and hit up mario because they will give you the best tour guide of you'll ever get no one knows Oaxaca like Mario knows Oaxaca they're like an ambassador to be honest um and and sharing our common experiences I think that the best thing about this project was that Mezcal always played such a huge plays such a huge just thread in the fabric of of, of Oaxaca that sitting around a table, sipping a little bit of mezcal and just um, talking to each other about the way that, that um, about, you know, the, the, the adversities that we face in common, but also how much different their lifestyles are. And, and no, not lifestyles, but how much different the lives are and how much um, misrepresentation has occurred because of that. And, and how, People think that they've that we've gained somehow that as 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 that somehow as as 
non-heteronormative people, we have gained some sort of tolerance, not just in Mexico, but in the world in general. Like, you know, the gays are being represented, the queers and the lesbians are being represented. So now there is like some sort of acceptance, but we've always been here. And I think that's what people continue to forget. And one of the reasons why I decided to to do this series is to is to remind everyone that queer lives have always been here and they've always mattered since before colonialism that if anything um the conquistadors from spain and colonialism and the catholic church were the reason why so many people were persecuted and why there was um and why that not only has continued from generation to generation has bled through people's lives but also um it has been a constant fuel for American imperialism. And, and it does the same thing. Evangelicals came over to South America in the early 90s, 80s, and 2000s. And with them came their beliefs to repel queer individuals um, from, uh, from existence and to ostracize them from, from culture, from society. I know that like when we were talking a little bit before this, you had talked about like through this project, sort of like creating, um, I don't know the exact word that you use, but like creating like almost like a contemporary archive of like pre-colonial history. Um, mm -hmm. Is there like a specific image that you feel like kind of speaks to that, that we can, that's in the slideshow we could talk about? Yeah, um, I wanna say, I mean, it is, Kind of like yeah like an archive if we go to i think it's slide slide number 10. yeah it should be 10. um so this is called this was original called traditions and um traditions customs so customs and traditions and this was shot at night in front of a, a cathedral um there was another photo and which their uh, resplandor was lit up on fire. And it was a very similar photo to this. Um, it's not my favorite photo. I, I always feel like it's better to edit down than to that. It's not my favorite photo just based because I sucked at shooting it and I could have done better, but it was also like late at night, a lot of variables, different variables. I do plan on going back and trying it again. Um, but the reason why we wanted to shoot this was based on that, on, on that thought that I had said before, how with the conquistadores from, from Spain, when they came, they just essentially took over most of the land. In order to be able to um, take control of the people, they destroyed the sacred grounds, they built churches right on top, and with that, they erased their history. Um, so even though Muslims have a very, very good relationship with the Catholic Church, I think it's important to know like that that relationship with the church comes with a level of marginalization and with this image, what we wanted to do is to have them standing proud in front of this cathedral, um, hand in hand. And I knew I wanted to shoot it with my lens so that you can see the sensor around it and kind of create this ghastly kind of image um, to like reference like the ghost of the past. Um, it kind of looks like a, um, like uh like when you look into like uh, those magic balls or whatever that tell you the future like a fortune teller um but in essence this image was to was to um bring up the the fact that so much history was erased by colonization so much native history was erased by by colonization I know that like in uh, some, uh, a lot of these images have like uh, a lot of context to them that you might not be aware of if you're not as like familiar with uh, this community as you are. Uh, there was one image in particular I wanted to pull up. I think it's the, I can't see what slide it is, but it's the one of Trinity that's, she's in the pool with uh, mm -hmm. all of the petals. Uh, could mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about how you approach this one as well as like the kind of historical context of the imagery. Yeah, of course. Um, so just for rephrasing, um, I knew this was before and I totally 
missed this, but her name is Shaneri. Um, and something that she had said was that whenever a mush is born, a flower is born because mushes are born smelling like flowers. Um, and so water has always been one of those was it's, it's uh, water is an element of life. Um, and also something very much in what, what we discuss is that mushes are usually not eroticized. Um, it's kind of looked down upon in mushy culture to be centralized or because it's dangerous. At the end of the day, the last thing you can do is be persecuted for, um, for, for living your best life. But so what we wanted to do is take this resplendor and actually put nothing underneath it um, and just have all the focus on her face and have her kind of like emerging from this pool of water with all the rose petals around her, almost like she's having this um, rebirth. Um, I think there's a strong, strong power in power of self in sex. There's a strong knowledge of self and sex. There's a strong knowledge of, of, of who you are as a person in eroticism. I think that's why it's so important for bodies to be documented by the people who have those bodies, um, as opposed to much of history and photography that most people, most news that we have recorded from previous were shot by cisgender white men. I think that in this image, what I love the most about it is her, I don't wanna say her confidence, but it's just that she is almost, she's essentially almost stripped of everything. Um, I said, the resplandor, which is a symbol of, of who she is. It's just one, one item that is a symbol of who she is. And, 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 and yeah, and her reemergence of, of becoming this person who, that she's always been, that's always been in there. I think I, when, I, when I first discussed this with Shanetti, there was, she had began, she was not began, but she was getting a lot of, of um, her advocacy work was getting a lot of knowledge and acknowledgement and her art, her weaving was getting a lot of acknowledgement. And it was more like affirmation um, for her to, it was, it was part, this is also part of like affirmation of, of, of being okay with who you are racially, and by that mean I mean colorism, and also being okay with who you are, um, gender wise. There's like a real uh, collaborative approach that you take to to all of these images. Was that something that you like had in mind when this project first started, or did that develop? Um, little by little, it's developed. Um, I want to say from the first, I think there, there are way more photos, obviously, than, than the ones on the slide and also the ones that are up on my website that I determined that are, should be included in the series. Um, most of the ones that didn't make it to the edit are the ones that I kind of had premeditated before I came and I was like, I kind of want to shoot a photo like this just because it looks good. I think I found that if I couldn't really have the if, if I couldn't write about it, it wasn't worth it. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I am enjoying doing this so much is not just to it's just not to get to know people. I mean, that's obviously that's given. That's that's one of the best things ever is being able to make friends. Um, but I think. Uh, uh, something that's uh, something that's great that's coming from this is being able to have a a record of these different generations that are coming up right now within this community that has had their customs and traditions for hundreds of years that have been passed down, but also are now like if we think about it, we literally just had the internet like twenty years ago. So they're going through this point of transition where they're redefining their culture, they're redefining their roles within their own community. Um, 
And there's no need to document it because they're all doing it themselves. Everybody has a phone nowadays in their hands. But I think what, what's really cool about this is, is the fact that, that we're not only celebrating their existence, we are also making a record of, of where things have been, where we are now, and hopefully this can continue to go on moving into the, into the future. It was really exciting to kind of like, when we had talked earlier, you you mentioned how this was like a project that you see like going on for like a really, a really long time. What are your kind of hopes with, with this work? Um, for me, this is essentially a, it's a, it's a call of arms against femicide, um, against all the lives, all the transgender lives, all the lives against women that have been lost and that just that have not been brought up to justice in Mexico and Honduras and Colombia and Brazil specifically, which are like some of the countries with the highest rates of transphobia and um, hate attacks towards the transgender community. Um, I want to continue doing this project focusing on on the reality it, that is that queer people have always been here in history. Um, so I want to go continue to go to more First Nations groups and seeing what their relationship is with um, gender non-conforming identities and um, and and sexual orientation and being able to um, record, like, like not record that, but being able to like um, take that into account and, and create a, a an archive of, you know, what is happening right now in the early 21st century. I think that this is actually like a really good oh, transition. Sorry. Oh, am I, okay. I was gonna say, I think that this is a good transition to like our next set of questions actually, because we know that um, a lot of people that are in the APA network also have a lot of uh, passion projects that they're working on, but finding funding for those can be a challenge. Um, so we wanted to ask some questions specifically about uh, this grant, kind of applying for funding. Um, so I'm gonna pass it off to Edwin uh, for this next part. Perfect. Thank you, Gonzalo. Um, well, this has been so inspiring. I just need to say a quick comment here. Um, just hearing all of the background and everything that you have created on this project, you know, it's, it's just so inspiring because, you know, as an Im immigrant to this country, you know, sometimes um, people forget how we got here and the fact that, you know, you are here and you're trying to bring all of these um, and highlight all of these uh, communities. It just shows so much values that you have as a human. So it's it's beautiful to see that you know you're spending your time on making these these people you know highlight and like you know it's it's so meaningful to them every every moment they get to to be recognized. Sometimes they don't ever had that opportunity with their lives. So it's beautiful. I would love to see this in a museum one day. So great, great, beautiful work. So, so inspiring. Um, but yeah, following on Gonzalo's questions, you know, Thank there you. might be other people out there like, like you that, you know, that want to have funding and like, you know, eventually have an opportunity to like keep working on their own personal projects. And, you know, we just put together a few questions that might help answer some of their questions. How do you get these? So. One of that question is, how do you hear about this grant? Um, the APA grant specifically, I heard through Picture. Picture is a great platform that you, it's a free platform that you can get access to. Um, and it has um, many different, from open calls to grant submissions, to um, publication submissions, to portfolio reviews. Um, um, you don't have to pay unless you're gonna 
do a specific application that requires you to pay a fee. Um, for the APA application, I don't believe there was a fee. Um, there's also, there's a, there's a lot of other um, platforms out there. Some of them are more focused locally. If you happen to be in the New York City area, I would say the New York Foundation for the Arts is it's uh, um, a great place to start looking. Um, there is Call for Arts. Uh, oh, it's it's Cafe. It's literally what what the um, acronym is, but it is um, C A F E, and they also have um, a lot of of um, opportunities for artists. Um, there is, and then if you look at Instagram, there are a couple of, of also, um, um, people that would curate like, um, Art Adia, Art Connect Opportunities, um, Art Enda, like Agenda, but it's artenda.net, um, Artwork Archive, um, those are a couple that, that I know of that, that will post um, um, opportunities for, for artists of different disciplines. Um, doesn't just have to be lens based or photography. Um, and, um, and I think for this specific grant, um, I really relied a lot on, on my background as a producer. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's good. What I learned the most from all of this was that you're gonna have a hundred doors shut on your face and eventually you're gonna find a window that's gonna be open and you're just gonna crawl through that window or you're <laughs> gonna make your way in it. But um, don't be afraid to fail because you won't win unless you fail. Um, I, applied for so many different things, especially with this series, because I quit my nine to five to be able to pursue this full time. And, um, and um, it was, it was tough at a point where you're like, you're like, and I don't think anyone believes in this. I'm like, what am I doing? You start doubting yourself. Um, but eventually um, you just have to keep trying. Um, and grow with your work like you um, like you are yourself. I think, like I said before, when I first started like submitting this series for any type of help or any type of uh, like, publication or anything like that, what I would write is completely different to a year ago to what I have right now. It's a continuous work and eventually you're gonna get it. Um, you just can't stop applying. Um, but yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. Great, thank you for all those resources and advices. Sounds great. Um, tell us a little bit about your approach applying for this grant. Um, I really, I really relied a lot on on what I had learned as a producer. I essentially, back in that job, I would do um, commercial and editorial um, production for photographers. So part of that was like creating a budget sticking to the budget logistics um and from what, what i learned from this specific experience is that being able to communicate to somebody essentially as detailed as possible how you plan or how you foresee approaching approaching or um or um a vision um makes it easier for you to um to uh um bring your point across and to actually uh, make sense and also have them see what you're seeing. Um, so I would say never leave it for the last moment, never leave it for the last minute. I would always have the deadline in my calendar on my phone, but then I would have it with an alert with like two weeks prior to that. And at least two to three weeks prior to the deadline, I would begin working on it. Because the, the few times that I did apply for anything within the 24 hours before it ended, I never got it. So, I mean, for that, probably for that same reason that procrastination just doesn't work. Mm. Okay. Uh, any tips that you have to be a competitive ap applicant that you want to share? 
Um, definitely don't leave it for the last minute. Um, review your application two or three times before you submit it. Don't rush it. I think rushing is probably the worst thing you can do. Um, something very specific and I'm not trying to like push anything or or convince anyone that there's you need to get this for success or anything like that but to be honest like Grammarly has something that helped me a lot um, especially having English as my second language and there's times where we're just like sentence fragmentation and stuff like that just doesn't it's not something that I was did great with but um being able to have good sense of writing and knowing how to write really helps a lot um i feel like most computers nowadays and most softwares have that stuff included in it it comes already like formatted into into the 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 product or whatever um but yeah i, I would say just revising and trying to edit down as much as possible i think it's always good to be direct and never repetitive and um and constant essentially yeah that's great yeah these are really good kids do you have any tips on finding funding for personal work i can't really tell you that i have much experience in funding personal work most of the the, the, the images that, that I submitted for the application were all self-funded. I worked as a server for a little bit under 12 years and all of my money that I would make um, serving tables, I would use for my photography. Um, but there are grants out there. I know here in New York, there is um, the state annually serves, sends out um, grants for artists. Uh, it really depends on where you live. Um, I totally understand that in a lot of smaller communities that you might not be able to have that. But also I think it's, it's good to build a community in itself. Um, something that I learned was that the money is always out there. You just have to go and get it and find it and get it. Um, and it takes time, you know, it's never going to be day to night. But I definitely think that um, it's, it's something that I'm starting to understand even more, especially now. And, and and realizing that um, if your work brings people together, it's because it means something. And then communities open up opportunities and those can be financial as well. That's great. Um, can you tell us how this grant will support your work? Yeah, so I'm happy to announce that I will be returning to um, continue the second phase of this project this coming November. Um, and I, I'm really going in this time. I'm really going for it. I think the first time that I went, I was a little bit apprehensive because, you know, it was a first time experience and there's always like self-doubt and you're like, can I really do this? And then I'm the type of person that if I'm away from my husband for like one day, I'm like falling apart. But I think I think this time I'm really, I, I, I sense the responsibility. I, I sense that there's something that has been bestowed upon me that is more than just responsibility, but it's a sense of, of, of um, doing people proud and, and, and making sure that, that it's not just done with intention, but also that is executed successfully and um i i'm, I'm certain that that this is going to be um on a much more grander scale i think what i want to focus on this time is um having a dialogue with the elders of the community and seeing where their points of view differ from John, the younger generations and and like i said i'm not there to to particularly document anything um or to say someone's wrong or someone's right they're the only the only one that's right over here 
I mean, the only one that's wrong here is um, whoever stands for transphobia, whoever is standing against people having equal rights. I think that's the that's the only thing that matters is is to be able to denounce those things. Um, and I feel like all of us are on the same page. That's great. Mm. Well, thank you so much for all those answers. And thank ideas. you. We're gonna bring back Liam to do a wrap up questions follow up here. So take it away, Liam. Amazing. Thank you so much, Daniel, for being here with us today. What didn't we talk about? Is there is there anything that we didn't discuss today that you want to share with the audience or anyone who who watches or listens to this in the future? Um yeah, I think I think it's important that if you are a photographer, um don't I, I don't think you should be afraid of of a photographing period, you know. I just it's like without when you they say you know your place, know your worth. Um because at the end of the day you do have a point of view. Um, but I think what is important is that you realize that your point of view might be there, but is it wanted? Or can your focus be in somewhere better? Um I think that's something that I myself continue to think about every single day. And um, and I think also people should not forget the fact that we as, yeah, we as, as, as queer individuals do have a history. You know, most of it has been erased. Most of it has been forgotten. Um, but we've always been here and we're always gonna be here and we're beautiful so get used to it <laughs> i love i love it i love it and i i think um I, I mean i don't know about everybody else but i'm certainly inspired by your voice and the stories that you're telling and the <clears throat> the point of view that you're communicating visually through your work so i'm excited to continue following this journey and where can folks keep an eye on what you're doing? Where can we follow this project? Um, how can we support you as you continue on with this? Yeah, um, I mean, I am on danieleros.com. So the last name is spelled A-R-O-S.com. Um, my Instagram is, uh, used to be senorados, but with the, the N-A is an N-A. So S-E-N-O-R-A-R-O-S. Um, you should definitely have a uh, reach out to Shaneri, which is at Damisen, D-A-M-I-S-E-N. Amitai Verdugo is at A-M-I-T-A-I-V-E-R-D-U-G-O. And then Mario Come Oaxaca is Mario.com.e. Oaxaca, which is O-A-X-A. CA. Um, so yeah, you should definitely, anyone that wants to um, reach out and see how we're doing. Um, I think Instagram is just the most basic platform. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. We'll make sure that we um, get all those links in the descriptions and stuff. So it's easy for folks to just click and, and find, um, find you all. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so happy to have you. Congratulations on the grant. Um, such an exciting project. And um, and I think I speak for all of us that we're just so excited for you to, to, um, to be able to con continue on in this way. So thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Yeah.